you started out uh, a marketing career, then moved into service and innovative companies. Tell us your story. I started launching my own companies. Uh, first, I launched a marketing automation kind of slash Salesforce consulting firm. And I then got very excited slash angry one day about a charge that I received from Time Warner Cable. And that is the idea, the, the circumstance that prompted me to launch my first tech company. One is always running away from something towards another. I think for me, I am certainly motivated and driven by learning because it's always like a, just a fun way to see people's eyes open and, you know, for them to find counterparts all around the world. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, welcome to Silverbacks Valley. I'm your host today and my name is Ibrahim Sanya. Gentle reminder before we start, click that subscribe button and never miss stories of founders and funders changing sports, tech, and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world. Now enjoy the show. This episode is supported by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. Richard Todd, its host, invites you to a new season titled People Over Profits. If you are into artificial intelligence, AI, this is the show for you. Download Mozilla IRL wherever you get your podcast. We at Silverbacks Valley are big fans. All right, Courtney, good morning to you. It's so kind of you to join us today. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. I'm really honored uh, to be here with you today. So we're going to jump right in uh, about you. You started out uh, a marketing career, then moved into service and innovative companies that you were running yourself. Then you spent some time in real estate. Tell us your story. And at which point did you decide that tech was the thing you are going to focus on? Yes. Um, it's always fun to look back and think about the very circuitous journey. I think that uh, all of us go on. So, um, you know, I actually joined the first startup that I ever worked for when I was in college. I was 19, uh, turning 20. And I had been uh, largely nannying, uh, you know, being a nanny to work my way through college. And I decided that I wanted to get into a quote unquote business. And I looked on Craigslist to try and find a job for somebody who had the skills that I had at that time. Mm -hmm. And because I had been on the high school newspaper, I knew how to use uh, Illustrator and Photoshop uh, that, you know, they were called at the time. And I met two gentlemen who had just started um, a company. They were in their mid-30s. It was already a, a few startups in for them. And it was focused on basically doing aggregated buying for promotional products like branded pins and koozies. So I was their first employee at a company called Balmas Network. And I distinctly recall two things about that experience. Number one, the founder uh, had a yellow legal pad. And on that yellow legal pad, he was describing what would go on to become the technology product that was going to be built uh, to aggregate buying. And I remember him saying, like, this is my vision. This is what we can do. And then I was able to follow along that journey to, I remember getting our first check for a million dollars from the CEO of Walmart at the time. Uh, and then the company went on to raise $50 million and was eventually acquired uh, by Zazzle. So I spent five years uh, at Boundless and I started, as I said, as an intern in marketing. And when I left, I was, I think, the senior marketing manager there. Uh, I dropped out of college my senior year uh, because I was already kind of so heavily involved in, uh, in the business side of things. And so I had the bug for startups uh, very, very young and really just the exposure to the fact that you could have an idea on a yellow notepad and you could turn it into something that employed hundreds of people and generated real value. So uh, yeah, from there, I started launching my own companies. Uh, first, I launched a marketing automation kind of slash Salesforce consulting firm. And I then got very excited slash angry one day about a charge that I received from Time Warner Cable uh, with regard to my cable bill. 
And that is the idea, the, the circumstance that prompted me to launch my first tech company, uh, which was called Public Demand and was really meant to help consumers who had complaints with big companies and couldn't get help. So that was my first tech startup. And this is way back in 2010, 2011. And that's actually when I met 500, uh, who had also just started at the time. And 500 invested in my company. And I went through one of their very early accelerators uh, and moved to Palo, uh, Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, uh, Mountain View area uh, back in 2012. And that was pretty much it for me. Uh, I was a CEO uh, of that company for several years. Uh, before becoming CEO of another tech uh, company, which was in the real estate space, um, and uh, ran that company for a few years before I joined uh, Keller Williams, which is the largest residential real estate company in the world. And I built their consumer products, uh, their listings products, and then eventually got involved in corporate development and diligencing deals on the investment side for their family office. And uh, eventually joined 500 to continue my uh, venture and investing career. Wow. So long, wow. long story, <laughs> but that is uh, that is the journey from 19 to wow. where I am today, 20 years later. That is a fabulous journey. So in terms of uh, your inspirations and triggers, there is a quote that says, yeah, one is always running away from something and running out towards another. What are those two things for you? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting quote and, and way to think about things. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, I am certainly motivated and driven by learning. Uh, I feel that, I don't know, the world is so big uh, and there's just so much that, you know, one should want to and can absorb in life. So I'm very, very motivated to learn as much as I can, as, as deeply as I can. Um, and I actually think that's really related maybe to what I run from, which is any sense of intellectual boredom. Um, I think that's something that I, I struggle with. Uh, whether it was in school or, you know, if uh, I haven't had a lot of non-founder related jobs, but, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely need to feel like I'm learning, feel like I'm advancing. And then I would say something to add on top of that, that has really uh, been more apparent in the last few years, perhaps as I've gotten older, is I want and I need to feel like I'm a part of the team and a part of a community. Um, and so that for me is also a big driver uh, to feel like, you know, I'm, I'm running this race with other people that, you know, I love and admire and, um, you know, that I can contribute to the communities that, that I'm a part of. No, that's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Well, your platform, uh, 500 Global is a colossal player in the ecosystem. And in uh, part of your mission is to invest in potential and turn it into performance. How do you define potential? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, you know, 500 is, is such a unique uh, beast, <laughs> as it were, uh, in the sense that when the company started at the end of 2010, uh, you know, it, it was, it was small at first, right? 29 million was, uh, the, our first fund. Uh, but even within that first fund, there was this concept that we didn't just have to invest in at that time, Mountain View, Menlo Park, right? So back then, even the idea of like investing in San Francisco was crazy, let alone, you know, the idea of investing around the world. So within that first fund, 500 was really already investing in Mexico and Latin America uh, and Southeast mm. Asia, et cetera. And I think the belief in terms of what potential is, I think it was just underwritten by just the fact that, you know, Christine and the other early members of 500, they had operator backgrounds, right? So they didn't come from a finance background at that time, venture was a real kind of gilded space. 
where you had people who were already extremely wealthy, uh, you know, working on Sand Hill Road, who didn't have much interest in really seeing outside of, you know, that gilded cage. And that was just not how 500 wanted to be, right? There was always this concept that venture could be approachable, uh, that venture should be finding talent everywhere because that talent does exist everywhere. Um, today, many of the partners of 500, including those who have been there since the beginning, um, are either immigrants themselves to the U.S. or are uh, first-generation uh, Americans. And so I think this was also probably a really significant driver for the way that we think about potential today. Uh, but, you know, my uh, family is a Mexican-American and uh, there was always a, kind of a, a sense of, in some sense, on my mother's side uh, of being an outsider, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think all of us kind of had this bent to us. Um, and so that's probably a big part of when we think about potential, we don't think all potential originates from Stanford, right? Uh, potential originates from everywhere. So this is, you know, really what we believe. We believe there's tremendous upside in that. And it's not actually a belief, right? Just look at our first three global funds. They're top decile performers across venture. So this thesis that there is talent everywhere and that just needed opportunity and capital is playing out in real time. Half of our Mm. 50 unicorns today are from outside of the United States. Half of the unicorns that exist in the United States are started by people who immigrated to the United States. Wow. So that tells you really how distributed uh, technology, you know, tech talent truly is. Uh, and so, so that's, yeah, that's what we believe. And that is the basis for, you know, 500, 3 billion in assets under management today. We're investing in 80 countries because that belief is, it works. Wow. Now this is, uh, this music to my ears. I really, really love those uh, data points you're dropping for us. You've now been uh, with 500 Global uh, four years. Yes. What do you think are the superpowers you've developed while, while there? All the superpowers you have uh, finessed and fine tuned while there? And what are the greatest lessons learned? Yeah, that's. Um Interesting. I, I'll often say to people, actually, I was just uh, with our CFO this morning and um, 500 is, is like the crucible adventure, right? Because most firms are relatively small in the sense that they might have one fund at a time. They're investing in one thesis in one country. We have 30 funds. Uh, uh, you know, We're raising six funds this year. So the way 500 does venture is just extremely... Uh, atypical. And so I think my learnings are going to be related to two things, the way 500 does venture and also my evolution from a founder to the other side of the table. Um, So as a founder, I think the superpower that mattered was your ability to assess risk and then take a qualified risk, right? Um, It takes a lot of, of you know, I think they, they talk about St- Steve Jobs, like delusional fields, right? There's some aspect of you that has to be a little bit nuts to want to solve some big problem. But I think, you know, uh, moving from the founder operator side to what I do at 500 today has really, really helped me to hone uh, the way that I view risk and reward. So my job is to really uh, understand from a business perspective, where it is that we want to put a fund, uh, why we want to put a fund there, what that return is expected to be, what the thesis is that's going to drive the most value for our shareholders and our limited partners, and um, also what the teams you know need to be in order to make this happen. And all of this is wrapped into our mission, which is to uplift people and economies around the world through entrepreneurship. And this is a really important part of 500 and an important part of what drives me and and I think also my own superpowers, which is this idea of contribution uh, to, you know, creating these really sustainable uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world. So it's obviously we're very performance oriented first, but we believe that 
by creating these vehicles, these teams around the world and investing in these founders, that that is truly what will move societies forward. Um, so yes, being able to hone my like risk reward, uh, kind of mental model, I think is, is one thing. And then in terms of the way that 500 does venture, you know, I'm really fortunate and blessed to be able to visit so many countries around the world to see founders, uh, all around the world. I, I can't even count how many countries I've been in, uh, in this past, you know, probably two months, let alone four years. And I think, uh, the superpower has been to be able to just absorb a new way of thinking. Every place that I go to, whether, you know, it's Saudi Arabia or Senegal or Pakistan or Singapore or, you know, wherever it is, the world is just so much bigger than what I ever understood it to be. And I am constantly trying to expand my brain and be open to what I'm seeing and what I'm absorbing to make those mental models better. So, um, yeah, I'm really committed to the learning aspect of things. And I just, um, I wish everybody had the opportunities that I do to, to see, uh, you know, how big this world really is. Amen. Amen to that. And congrats on your recent, uh, expansion in uh, Pakistan. I mean, it's always uh, fabulous to see, uh, how groups like yours, uh, tackle out of the U.S. and in market like the Middle East, Saudi, where you based now Pakistan, and I think not long ago you were in Senegal. So really, uh, that velocity of uh, market expansion is really to be uh, commended. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, misconception, uh, so there's a lot of misconception about uh, the VC industry. You find people on the other side. And uh, coming up with a lot of uh, uh, negative uh, negative views or misunderstanding. Uh, how do you think uh, Five Hundred Global is uh, contributing to challenging uh, these misconceptions in the market and uh, public eye? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good question. I think there's certainly VC can be wielded in a way that it is a real contributor to economies, right? Um, and I think we've seen that play out since the venture capital uh, industry got started really in the 50s and the 60s uh, at, uh, in California and then kind of spread out uh, from there. I think the, the issues that have evolved were the fact that it wasn't inclusive. It wasn't inclusive geographically. It wasn't inclusive from just a, a you know, a, just a demographics perspective uh, just all of it. It was so um, closed uh, for so mm. long. And, and so I think that's one element of things is the lack of inclusivity, which like, I'm not saying that just for the inclusivity sake, it's also just a bad business decision, right? To exclude mm. a, half the population, you know, 90% of the population outside of the US. Uh, it, it was just the wrong move on multiple levels. I think the second element that's emerged in uh, more recent years is, you know, what is actually being invested into uh, just making sure there's some constraints or at least awareness with regard to the companies that you're investing in and, you know, what the outputs potentially are going to be uh, from those companies. So in terms of 500, uh, you know, I, I think the very fact that 500 was, uh, you know, started uh, by operators, meant really to be something that was inclusive from the beginning, was pretty heretical. Today, 500 is run by women. Uh, you know, it is over 50% women. Um, and we continue to invest, you know, heavily uh, in a very distributed way around the world, whether it's in demographics, geographically, uh, or otherwise. Um and then I think the other element of things that we really try and do through our education programs. So, you know, 500 is unique in the sense that there's kind of three prongs to what we do. There is the investment, you know, directly into startups, of course. Uh, we're now investing multi-stage all the way from seed through pre-IPO uh, checks and have dedicated funds that are seed funds, series A funds, series B funds, and, and, and coming beyond. Uh, but there's two other really important elements that people often miss. 
So one is our education programs. So we uh, teach emerging uh, venture capitalists, emerging angel investors, emerging family offices all around the world. And we do this because we want there to be a broader venture capital ecosystem. And we want there to be good practices in the markets for founders. Because what we have witnessed, because we've been investing in, uh, you know, kind of newer nascent and emerging markets around the world, that oftentimes when venture or angel investing comes online, the terms that founders get in emerging markets are often far worse than what a founder would get in an advanced uh, economy. Mm. And so mm. this is also a big part of our contribution. We want to see founders treated fairly. We want to see a healthy venture capital ecosystem, be it family office angels or you know fund managers themselves. So that education piece is really important. And we've trained over 800 uh, investors, uh, fund managers around the world. I'm very excited about that. And then finally, yeah, yeah. The, the third part of 500, where we try to have an even bigger impact is the fact that we do advise governments around the world uh, with regard to policy, uh, policy that is going to be affecting entrepreneurs, whether it is visa policy, regulatory, sandbox, uh, you name it, we want to contribute at the highest levels so that these ecosystems will develop faster, for one thing, and uh, number two, in line with best practices around the world. So that three-pronged approach for us, uh, I believe, will help uh, with some of the more negative misconceptions of venture. Um, and uh, I, I get equally excited about investment education and you know the work we're able to do with governments. That is fantastic. That last uh, leg uh, would uh, greatly benefit the African continent, the African governments. This episode is supported by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. Bridget Todd, its host, invites you to a new season titled People Over Profits. If you are into artificial intelligence, AI, this is the show for you. Download Mozilla IRL wherever you get your podcasts. We at Silverbacks Valley are big fans. Uh, definitely uh, in need of some uh, guidance. And in fact, uh, talking of Africa, uh, it would be good to hear about your portfolio growth trajectory. And uh, if you can also tell us within that growth trajectory, uh, one or two transactions you got very excited and you're most proud about in terms of contribution. Yes. Um, it's always hard to like kind of pinpoint uh, the startups that are your, that, uh, you know, your, are your favorites. So I don't think you're supposed to have favorites, but I might name a couple. Um, so, so first of all, in terms of our uh, investing in Africa, today we've made over 100 investments across the continent. Um, although, thank, thank you. Uh, but uh, truly even that just feels like a very, you know, drop in the pond, right? Um, we've not to date had a dedicated fund in Africa. We have been investing primarily out of our global fund uh, that is based in the U.S., but of course invest all over, as well as our MENA funds uh, where we were picking up a lot of the North African uh, deals. So in the future, we very much hope that uh, this will uh, change and we'll be excited to share some more news about our um, ongoing portfolio, Pan-Africa portfolio strategy. Um, but as I said, we've been able to make over 100 investments so far on the continent. And uh, a couple that come to mind, uh, we were just speaking about Senegal, and of course, I was able to go for the first time a few months ago. So we invested in Outsourced Venetics or Calispot, uh, which was uh, quite exciting for us and really keen to see what the team is able to do there in terms of banking as a service and the platform that they're building. Um, I've spent quite uh, a bit of time in Egypt recently. In fact, I'm heading to Egypt in just a, a couple of weeks. Uh, so one, one, I think kind of interesting, uh, deal or actually kind of two deals there that for whatever reason stand out in my mind, we backed a company, uh, two female founders there, um, a company called Shefa, uh, which yes. is prescription delivery. Oh, oh okay. Amazing. So, so yeah, I, I think there's really just such an opportunity across healthcare, um, you know, in Egypt and, and of course, Africa more broadly. Um, but I'm particularly proud of uh, the founders of Chefa. So that's uh, one that stands out. A second company, um, I just was meeting again with the founder a few months ago when I was in 
Egypt uh, is called Home Smart. Uh, so we were in Home Smart Seed Round. They've done really, really well uh, bringing kind of furniture, kind of e-commerce uh, furniture play, but also actually getting into some really interesting data um, and visualization for um, home decor. So uh, there's so many companies and so many incredible founders. And I'd love to tell everybody that one big learning for me has been that it doesn't matter if you're in Senegal and Palo Alto and Riyadh and Vietnam, like founders are the same everywhere. That energy and this kind of need to solve a problem and see your vision of the world created, like that, that energy feels the same. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise, like just how tangible it is. Um, and so I really love when we're able to get founders together from uh, multiple markets because it's always like a, just a fun way to see people's eyes open and, you know, for them to find counterparts all around the world. Very cool. Very cool. Talking about cool stuff, you made me discover Balaji on base and his uh, fantastic work on network state. So obviously right away, he became one of my favorite thinkers. I think only Naval, Ravikant and uh, uh, Yuval Hariri are still ahead of him. But I'm thinking that... Uh, He's, uh, he's, he's uh, creating a lot of perturbation, even for the top places. What does he uh, represent to you and what uh, his book uh, holds as a meaning uh, for our lives ahead? Yeah. So I'm going to say uh, a bit about, I don't know Yuval, but I do know uh, Naval from Ageless. Um, and I want to say something about him before I move on to um, Balaji. So, um, Nabal invested in my uh, first uh, startup, which was called Public Demand, same round that 500 came in. And at the time, he was starting AngelList. And um, I, I mean, I still listen to his podcast, How to Get Rich Without Being Lucky, which is super ironically titled. It's not about getting rich. It's totally about mindset. I listen to it. I, I try at least three or four times a year. Um, and just to make sure that I'm continually like pushing my own mental models. And I think he does such an incredible job of articulating how technology is really just eviscerating, um, all of the old ways of thinking. And so, um, I always recommend that one to people. I think it's really important. And, um, what he's done with AngelList is just incredible. Um, apology, uh, I've recently, I just spent several days uh, with Balaji. I was really excited to get to uh, know him a little bit more. Um, I think he's just truly like one of the greatest thinkers of our time. Um, and the network state, uh, I, I, I absolutely believe everybody should read this. To me, it is the most important work that's been written since the Bitcoin white paper. Um, I'm a big mm -hmm. believer in decentralization I think Bitcoin was, you know, really kind of the the domino, the first domino to fall uh, to create just the whole distributed, you know, decentralization ethos. Now, I think what Malaji is doing is so exciting because the way that he describes, I think he calls it um, the three Leviathans: God, network, and state. <laughs> you know, the the point is that you know uh, over time we've had these big, you know, kind of Leviathans that have really influenced every part of life. Originally, it was the church, then it was the formation of the state, which, you know, we're in. And then his thesis is that we're now transitioning into the network. Um, and, you know, that comes with a whole host of considerations. But the idea is that with the internet, the ability for people to form their own uh, states, whether or not uh, it is initially qualified as a state or not, he believes that it is a possibility that people who have a shared vision. So I think he uses the uh, description of keto, the keto state. So I, I actually am like a big keto advocate. I eat keto most of the time, but uh, yeah. So his idea is that, you know, this can really, if you find other keto lovers around the world and, you know, you want to build uh, your own state together, that can happen first in the cloud. But eventually it's a possibility that you find some land somewhere together and eventually, you know, you decide you're able to actually get um, diplomatic recognition. And so I think this concept 
is really exciting. And I don't think it's exciting because it any in any way necessarily replaces the current state. That is not the thesis. It is that it is it is additive to the states yeah. as they exist now. So um so what he represents to me is an inevitability. And I, you know, have spent a lot of time with them to try and understand uh, the thinking around this, because if you just step back for a moment and think about it from a, from a venture perspective, as these new network states come online, as this happens, be it, you know, in the next few decades, there needs to be an entire layer of infrastructure, technology infrastructure that is built to enable it. And I believe that that new layer of technology that has to be built will be massively profitable. And so yeah. this is very interesting to me, uh, you know, from the VC perspective and just fundamentally as, you know, a, as a lifelong learner, uh, it is yeah. to me a bit of an inflection point uh, in history. So couldn't recommend yeah. uh, follow these podcasts more in particular, uh, the two that he's done with Tim Ferriss are quite good and, I think he just did like yeah. an eight hour one uh, with Lex Friedman. Yeah. Uh, everybody's talking about this as well, but he's, he's yeah. a little spectacular. Uh, because since you introduced him to me a couple of years back, I have like a, a reminder. As soon as he posts something, my notification goes uh, off to a zoo. So I listened to that new three hour, I think the day after or the same day because of time zone. But uh, you'd be pleased to know that uh, there's, he has in inspired a group of uh, Africans that have a platform called Afropolitan, and he has invested himself, which are basically trying to do something with the African diaspora, with those concepts. And what I love the most, one of the, I mean, obviously between the Quito and network state, he has, what's great about how he integrates the past into today and leaps into the future in the most effective manner. And one of the, um, I mean, he's, he's a highly erudite man. So one of the cool terms he comes up with is a society as a service. Mm -hmm. Where he basically, yeah. which is one of the coolest term in his whole thought process, indicating that if you look at uh, whether you are on Twitter or Facebook, you already are part of these communities where you elect in and you can elect out at will, uh, yeah. which is uh, already a beginning of that. And those communities will just continue to ferment and cement themselves uh, within civilization as we evolve today. No, but uh, I'm super, super grateful. And now I'm jealous because uh, you're spending time with uh, these two people that I'm a big fan on fiction. So I'll be uh, following you closely because one of these days we'll have to all sit down in terms of uh, literally uh, books and quotes, I recently uh, ran into this quote that I want to share it with you. It says, revenue is vanity, profit is for sanity, and cash is reality. What does this quote uh, make you think about? So I'm going to give kind of two different answers. Um, the first is is going to be my answer as a founder and an operator. Um, really early on, <laughs> I learned that the most important uh, report you should be paying attention to is, is just cash flow. Um, your P&L can be a number of different things based on uh, you know how you choose to, uh, to kind of finesse things, but cash is is king still. Um, and, you know, businesses don't die because, uh, you know, they make a, a wrong hiring decision necessarily. They die because they run out of cash. So I do think the cash is reality is, is absolutely true, but I think it's more true as a founder and an operator than it is as a VC. And the reason I say this is because, you know, VC is about alpha, right? You are looking for the moonshots that are going to pay off with massive returns. So we're talking about what's happened with you know FTX and Binance. Um, we are not an investor in FTX or in Binance, but we did have our first uh, fund that was investing in crypto in 2016. Out of that fund, uh, we invested in a number of huge companies, uh, Solana being one, uh, that mm -hmm. has had massive returns. 
uh, for 500. Um, and so I think as a whole, we're still very bullish on the crypto infrastructure ecosystem. Um, I think the, what's happened in terms of, you know, kind of tokens and leveraging <laughs> your own tokens. Now that I think is a very different reality and, it, you know, perhaps, uh, will be a very different consideration for crypto founders, um, given what's happened over the last uh, six months or so, but these cycles are normal and, we will continue to have new categories created that have to go through the crucible of their own industry, you know, coming into something that is going to be substantial and permanent. I do believe crypto is a permanent industry and it is just still in the very, very early days. So why I say as a VC, cash is a little bit different. It's because you have to be willing to make those high conviction bets to be able to get a thousand X return on those early companies. So if we had looked at Solana from a purely, uh, what is their p and uh, right, in the early days, it, it simply, we, we may have said no. Uh, but fortunately, that's not how we looked at it. And, and you know, it's been a great investment for 500. Um, but again, I think VC is a mass uh, game in many senses. People don't often understand VC math and the fact that, you know, you really, 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 need to have very careful portfolio construction because in many cases, it is just one or two companies that can return your whole fund, or if you're lucky, your whole firm. Uh, so <clears throat> this is um, really critical, but I would think very differently, you know, uh, as, as a founder than uh, as a VC. Fantastic. Fantastic. We very much align there. What we tell our founders is uh, as an investor, they should treat us strictly as a bridge to autonomy. And that autonomy is cash. The cash they take from us today is a cash they ultimately will should not need. And for that reason, they need to have cash in an autonomous manner. And uh, there's definitely uh, links to your, to your thoughts. And uh, definitely those are great words of advice to to uh, to the entrepreneurs now, as you have uh, really uh, shared so much wisdom, is there any piece of literature or podcasts you would want to share for what you've read li lately? Yeah, you know, I'm actually going to open my iPhone and um, look at some of the the books because I've been tearing through uh, Audible. So. I'm, I, I listen to, to, if I'm not in a meeting or directly with somebody, I am listening to a podcast or a book. Um, I just started actually Only the Paranoid Survive uh, by Andy Grove uh, in light of some recommendations that I saw. Um, I've, I re listened recently to The Founders, which is about the, the PayPal story. Um, which I found like really took me back to um, another era. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to also just maybe share some personal ones because it's not all business. And I think if we focus completely on, you know, just the, the business and financial side of the world, then it's, it's kind of hard to be a, a whole person. Um, so, you know, something I've been trying to talk about publicly lately is um, I've been listening to a book that's called The Grief Recovery Handbook. I know a lot of mm. people lost uh, loved ones during COVID and, of course, just during the normal cycle of mm. life. But grief is something that we're never really taught about or how to process. Mm. So that has been really helpful for me uh, personally. Um, mm. And then um, let me see one more that I will mention. Okay, so another ironically titled book uh, was called How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. It is not mm. at all about uh, money. It, it was uh, basically the life story, uh, the kind of fictional life story of an individual who started out uh, kind of on a rice farm and then made his way you know, through the next uh, 80 years. And I found that a really insightful uh, journey. So those are the, uh, the audio cool. books. Yeah, and then podcast. I think you've already heard me mention, like if you haven't listened to Naval's uh, podcast, um, that's a big one. Uh, I like Tim Ferriss's podcast. Um, I've been listening a lot to Capital Allocators as well. So definitely on, yes, the, on the VC yeah. side. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, so th- those come to mind. And uh, on the the non-work side, I listened to Stuff You Missed in History class because if I was not in this line of work, I would have definitely have been uh, an academic uh, on the the history side of the world. And Oprah's <laughs> Super Soul Sunday, I also try and listen to just to hear something uh, different and uh, uh, not uh, just more, I guess, on the, the life side. Uh, super. Well, we're lucky that uh, we did not lose you to academia. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day. I may have that way. I don't know. <laughs> you can you can probably do that at retirement. I myself do consider it from time to time. I'll, I'll, I'll recommend a, a, a couple to you. Um, I really, uh, over the last quarter, I got a chance to read uh, uh, on, uh, on the Audible, uh, the, unicorn, uh, the Unicorn Shadow. So that's uh, huh. really cool. It definitely uh, opens a lot of spells out. And there's a book called Backable. 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 It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a book that's written by the brother Sanjay Gupta that's uh, doing the, the medical thing on CNN. He was at some point on the, on the cover of either Times or Forbes as the face of failure. So imagine all of us, we evolved trying to be the face of success. He was the CFO of uh, Groupon. And basically, they use his face as a face of failure while being an, the Indian brother of a super successful other brother. There's only two of them in the family. So he turned that moment of uh, weakness uh, as a moment of uh, transition. He, in, he sent uh, that cover to a series of uh, tech billionaires and say, this is me. Can you give me some word of advice? And started interviewing all of them, kind of re-engineer, rehacked himself and came up with this book as to what are the key features to be backable as a founder, individual. And then the one I've just uh, finished last week is uh, How to Invest by David Rubenstein, the founder of uh, Carlyle. Uh, it's a fan- it covers all the asset class. So he he speaks to the to all the VC, the Moritz of the world, but he also speaks to the leaders on the hedge fund side. Paulson, he speaks to the distress managers. He speaks to uh, also your wealth and family office managers. So he gives you a very broad. Uh, well, base. I'm going to listen to this one next. Yeah, yeah, that one is really, really, really. I think you'll love it. Since uh, we'll just keep on exchanging with each other, but uh, one couple of last questions. So if you had a chance to speak to your 19-year-old version of you, what would be a few words you would share with her? Okay, I'm going to give a response uh, again on like business and personal side. Uh, So I was a really young mother. So when I was 19, I already had a son. And I think, you know, at that time, I was very, very, very focused on, you know, just like trying to pay the bills, right? Just trying to make it, trying to make my way through school, et cetera. I think, you know, having, looking back now, I would love to have, you know, told myself how important it is to really uh, value that time with your children when they're young. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a lesson that is uh, maybe one of the most important lessons. So I think even above what we do for, you know, business or financial success, I think just being able to spend the time with your kids is, you know, really paramount. So that would be one thing. Um, I think the second component, um, you know, I was scared a lot, right? Um, I remember being in the first like business meeting I ever sat in and somebody said something about ROI and I didn't know, you know, what ROI meant. So I was then trying to like research, what is this ROI, right? Um, and I remember just, you know, having so many moments like that, but, um, I think, you know, maybe just telling myself that it's normal to feel that way. Um, I, Still, uh, you know, I think it's like if if I am the least smart, least experienced, least wealthy person in the room, then like I'm doing something right. 
And Mm. so that is something that like, I wish I would have like felt more confident in as that 19 year old and something that like, I still try and tell myself now, like, I don't need to know it all, have it all, be it all. Like the journey is, is really about um, that. It's the journey. Right. So I think just having a little bit more confidence um, at that age would have been great. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now that you've given uh, wisdom to yourself, at 19, any uh, parting words of advice to the African entrepreneurs and um, the audience listening uh, to this uh, podcast? We would like to thank you really graciously for your valuable time today. And really, uh, on that note, we'll leave the floor to you. Thank you so much, to bring you in. Really, it, it's truly an honor to uh, to be able to participate and Um, also just want to thank you for introducing me to so many, uh, fun, interesting, incredible people in Senegal as well. So, um, you know, I think in terms of advice for founders, um, especially in Africa, um, I think that there's such an incredible opportunity right now because there's so much digitization, uh, digitalization happening right now across uh, the content. And there's still a number of fields that are relatively wide open. So even though, of course, everybody talks about fintech, I still believe that fintech is in the early odds. Um, I think there's a tremendous way to go in terms of education, in terms of healthcare. I think there's still a lot of opportunity that it's going to exist in these major industries. Um, And so my advice is really just get started, right? I mean, the younger you start uh, doing companies, the better. Um, the average age of a founder that's actually experiencing um, an exit or success is actually like mid thirties. And if you actually study those founders, it's those who have already been starting companies, right? So the earlier you can start and like get these painful lessons, the better. Um, And then I would say finally, like people in terms of like global investors are beginning to look at the continent as a a viable place uh, for investment because we're seeing now unicorns like you mentioned chipper cash who went through our accelerator i believe you know three or four years ago and is now obviously doing doing quite well um and i think there's just so much opportunity there will only be more and more investment coming in to uh, africa but i also think that you know don't think too hard as a founder about the vc world right um your world is your customer and that is always the best source of cash. Um, so I think, you know, it's just keep about keeping your head down as a founder and iterating and not falling in love with your product, like fall in love with the customer. And uh, that, uh, that will take you a long way. Beautiful. Amen. Fall in love with the customer. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic words. Really, thank you so much, Corneo. Thank you. I really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you again soon. See you here. Bye. Hey, if you liked today's story, press like, leave a comment, subscribe, come back for more stories from the founders and the funders changing sports, tech, and entertainment from Africa to the rest of the world. We look forward to seeing you again soon.